Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining. We, on behalf of the South Carolina Tobacco Free Collaborative, we welcome you to part two of our Tobacco Cessation and Health Equity webinar series. The, South Carolina, the mission of the South Carolina Tobacco Free Collaborative is to eliminate the toll of tobacco use by providing leadership, guidance, and resources to state and local partners. The SCTFC's partnerships with coalitions are utilized to address local tobacco issues and to promote positive tobacco health policies at the community level. Our purpose is to provide leadership in the development of state, county, and local tobacco policies, to facilitate meetings of interested organizations and communities, to promote opportunities for current and future organizations to examine research, trends, legislative actions, and concerns and ideas, and to promote and support advocacy for tobacco safe communities. I now present to you today's webinar entitled Tobacco Retailer Density and Environmental Control, presented by Alana Kampf, Director of the Public Health and Tobacco Policy Center at North Eastern University School of Law. In compliance with ACCME guidelines, the following presenter has no financial or other relationships with the manufacture of commercial services discussed in this educational activity. The objectives for today's webinar are to characterize the impact of tobacco retail environment on consumer perceptions and behaviors, to evaluate the ways in which the tobacco industry shapes the retail environment, influencing consumer perceptions and behavior in order to drive youth initiation and tort cessation attempts by current users, to examine the impact of differential tobacco retail density and marketing on disadvantaged populations, including those with highest tobacco use rates, to evaluate the evidence base for tobacco interventions that reduce individuals' exposure to tobacco product marketing through reducing tobacco retail density, to assess necessary evidence-based interventions that reduce tobacco retail density and consumer exposure to marketing at the point of sale, and to discuss opportunities for collaboration between tobacco cessation and community control stakeholders. And now, Dr. Kampf. So thank you for having me today. Um, you just reviewed the objectives. And um, with that, I will move on to um, my normal caveat when I give these talks is that I am a lawyer, but not your lawyer. And so this is for educational purposes. Um, as we mentioned today, we're going to be discussing the retail environment and specifically um, how that impacts tobacco use rates and also the industry role in, in, influ in that influence. So I wanted to reiterate that materials uh, that highlight the evidence base for what I'm saying and provide specific citations will be available in the materials that are associated with this webinar. Uh, we also have a website tobaccopolicycenter.org and we have numerous materials on that website and I can help you find specific citations or support. Um, if you're not able to find them on your own, you can get in touch with me. A poll question. Approximately 67% of the audience feels that built environment has the greatest impact. All right. Um, well, as we are going to be discussing, um, really it's a cycle. Uh, and everything is interspersed and it's hard to separate all of these um, factors and they're certainly all factors in, in tobacco use. So as this slide indicates, really just want to introduce the concept that especially the practitioners in the room will likely be familiar with that um, individual behaviors are influenced by external factors in the environment. So neighborhoods and workplaces and schools influence health. And what an individual sees and experiences, both consciously and unconsciously, uh, really impacts the perception of what is acceptable, what is inevitable, and, and other factors as well. And this perception, in turn, shapes the behavior of that individual. It shapes both the behavioral defaults as well as choices and even the perception of having a choice. So accordingly, by focusing, as we often do in, in this society, on an individual self-control or desires and personal ethos, it's less likely to render positive 
health outcomes and we'll find more success from expanding our focus to the environment and how that environment shapes perceptions and and um, ultimately behaviors. So now turning this to specifically uh, the tobacco marketing in the retail environment and, and ultimately tobacco use. So we'll focus with the environment first. So looking at the marketing, and that really occurs today in what we call the point of sale or the retail environment, that is your store. It's a really important point to note that marketing is extraordinarily effective in the retail environment and tobacco companies have always known this. It's where people get their everyday items. There's a lot of exposure to these stores and therefore the marketing in the stores. Uh, it's always been important to the tobacco industry and then after 1990, the Master Settlement Agreement, um, that settlement agreement restricted um, the types of places where tobacco companies could market their products and they were left with the retail environment. Um, so they became even more critical to the strategy of, of the tobacco companies. And today the overwhelming majority of tobacco product marketing occurs in stores and actually to the tune, numbers just came out for 2015. Uh, today tobacco companies spend nearly $9 billion marketing their product and of that 8.5, nearly $8.5 billion is spent marketing tobacco products in stores in the US alone. So that number is 8.5 billion and I encourage you to look around and see what else you can buy for $8.5 billion. So um, looking at this slide again and how all of these are related to each other, this environment with this pervasive tobacco marketing of course shapes the perception. It indicates that tobacco use is very prevalent, that it's very acceptable and it's accessible it really normalizes tobacco use. And all of those factors, accessibility, prevalence, et cetera, are all factors in use. So then we get to the behavior and that perception translates and contributes to a higher likelihood of experimenting with tobacco, a higher likelihood of transitioning into regular tobacco use, and ultimately it challenges quit attempts. Uh, so there's a higher likelihood of failing to quit tobacco, um, despite in some cases there being a higher um, rate of attempting to do so. So we really need evidence-based interventions to break this cycle and to change the environment. That will then change the social norms. Uh, we really need to expand it beyond the individual and the individual initiative to make change. And by changing that environment, we'll change the environmental norms, and, and then ultimately uh, reduce tobacco use. I think we have another polling question. Question. So this question obviously is about point of sale retail. So the question is, on which of the following should advocacy groups place the majority of their attention if we want to address tobacco at point of sale? So it appears the early results show that the majority of the audience feels that tobacco marketing is where health professionals and advocacy groups should place the majority of their attention. Okay. Well, it might be partially a trick. Whoops. I'm sorry, I was paused. All right. Hi. <laughs> I am back. And that might have been a partially a trick question because really um, the marketing occurs um, throughout the other venues that were options on that poll. Um, but all, and all of those are factors which policy should and may address. So um, when we talk about that earlier slide that talked about the environment shaping perceptions which shape behavior, looking specifically to how does this translate to the community? And what does tobacco marketing look like? And how do tobacco companies use the marketing to shape the perceptions that drive use? Well, the overall goal is to have a significant overbearing presence in the community. So that will be the theme for all of the different ways they approach it are specific, but this presence. So this first slide, I, if you can see, 
the eat there's there are dots on this slide to indicate eat a tobacco retailer so it's a small slide but you get the idea you can see the intense density um, of representing which represents a tobacco retailer and you can do this for your own community through mapping whether it's a village a county or a state um, it's really interesting to note where those individual retailers are and we'll talk about that um, in, towards the end of the, the presentation but just the key takeaway here tobacco industry their strategy is to have their products sold in the highest number of stores possible. That's one of their approaches. Just get it in every type of store as frequently as possible. More retailers means that there's more price competition. That means prices are lowered, which is a factor in, in tobacco use. It means it's easier availability. It's more convenience to get more convenient to get to. There's more product advertising, more product displays, the unavoidable external and internal marketing at all of these stores, each and every store. It's more difficult uh, to enforce and to monitor tobacco sales and use laws even with, with the vast number of outlets. Um, and then overall, of course, it normalizes tobacco use. It really gives the impression that this is a very common product. Why would it be sold in so many places if it wasn't something that everybody wanted or needed? Um, in the US today, there are approximately 400,000 tobacco retailers. That's one for every 115 current smokers. So that's 400,000 retailers per 115 smokers. So. More than 50% of tobacco sales are from convenience stores, and that includes gas stations. Supermarkets and general retailers comprise about 30%, and tobacco specialty stores are around 10%. And the density of retailers, as we'll discuss um, even more detail later, is, is far higher in, in over most cases in low uh, areas of low socioeconomic status. Now you do, I do want to remember and recall that density is proportionality. So in rural areas, although you may not see that dark that you're seeing on that slide there, it, we're still talking about a proportion. So a proportion to the population, a proportion to other stores, proportion to land mass or commer where a commercial area, there are still often far more um, there's going to be a higher number or density in some of retailers, both in rural and urban. Um, so it's an important thing to remember since sometimes rural populations think that density discussions don't matter or are not as relevant to their communities. So number of outlets is one strategy that tobacco companies use. Another strategy is the location of those outlets. So while they like to have them in as many places as possible, they especially like to have them in certain places, and specifically in places near where youth congregate. So there's evidence that retailers are more highly concentrated in areas with a high proportion of youth. There is three times more advertising and promotional materials in stores located near schools or stores where youth frequent. So uh, this is an important strategy is the location. Youth uh, have a greater recall for the marketing and testing done. As, as adults, we're acclimatized. We don't notice necessarily we're these advertisements for products that we don't use. So we may just walk by. We wouldn't have been able to tell you what was advertised, whereas youth really do remember um, in great detail what the ads are. And this is important to remember we're not only talking about teenagers we're talking about this starting at a very young age so children are noticing the advertisements well before perhaps they're using the product or, or really even know to be interested in using the product but it helps shape that perception of normalization and acceptability which of course influence influence uh, later on use so location is a additional strategy that the tobacco industries employ for their marketing. Another, fa another strategy um, is the type of retailer. So each retailer, each outlet that sells tobacco and then in turn markets that product is a messenger for the tobacco companies and for those products. 
So whether implicitly or explicitly, it's sending a message. So the type of outlet is important. When you have, for example, as pictured here, a pharmacy selling tobacco products, it really sends an incongruent message. Uh, tobacco, uh, pharmacies today especially are marketed as mini healthcare institutions. So they are supposed to be part of your wellness program. And uh, there's also a conflict of interest given that the health, the pharmacies are selling and uh, many of the medicines that treat the diseases that tobacco use causes. So it creates a perception, um, it lowers the risk perception of tobacco use by having these healthcare institutions market the deadly products. And it, it really just it doesn't make sense that they are overwhelmingly in, in pharmacies and it's, it's starting to get some attention. Um, it's really not done in, in other countries. You won't find tobacco country uh, tobacco products sold in pharmacies the same way you do here in the U.S. Um, it, of course, also increases the density of tobacco, the density and number of tobacco outlets. So these pharmacies are very common, as you probably have. Um, and when they're sold, uh, when tobacco products are sold through a uh, pharmacy that, again, just contributes to that overwhelming presence in the community. And even in rural communities, sometimes there may only be one pharmacy. So someone who is trying to quit tobacco and needs to go in and get medicine or another necessity from the pharmacy may only have that one store to choose from and see the tobacco products. So um, that is another strategy to keep in mind. Um, and all of these strategies I'm talking about, we're going to talk about solutions. As the industry strategies, we'll talk about solutions, ending them. Another one is the price promotions. So gauging by the poll, many of you are aware that price is a factor in tobacco use, especially among some of the populations who use at the highest rate today. And we'll, we'll get into some of that. But most of marketing in general, of course, is price. It's advertising prices, listing the prices. And then um, usually accompanied with ways to make those prices cheaper. And price promotions are critical to the tobacco industry. Uh, they are very um, effective price promotions at decreasing the gap between premium products and non-premium brands. And youth especially are very brand name sensitive. As you all probably know from experience, you care about what they're wearing, what brands they have, and are seen with. So they're not really interested in carrying around packs of tobacco products that are you know, basic brand or, or are not associated with the glamour that um, are more associated with the name brand. So this this price promotions you really only see on the higher end brands, on the premium brands. Um, price promotions and marketing are very flexible, can be tailored to neighborhoods, tailored to populations, so it allows targeting. Um, it's also better than dropping overall prices because a lot of the price promotions are done directly between the manufacturer and the retailer. And that allows the manufacturer to control the store environment. This is a really important point to understand. Um, when you see how much money the industry spends on tobacco marketing, I'm not sure that slide worked as well, but um, this is an image we have on our website with um, you can see that the tobacco industry spends overwhelming dollars on reducing the price of their products. They spend um, in the billions of dollars to keep prices low, and they do that in addition to the marketing that you see with the uh, coupons that are directly to the consumer. A lot of it is uh, incentives to the retailer. So if retailers are able to move so much, such a certain volume of product, and to sell that volume, they become they get they become premium retailers, and they get incentives and um, cash, do, you know, dollars, or they're able to then buy products, the tobacco products, at a lower rate. So they buy their cartons lower than than their neighbor across the street, um, their competitor, and so they're able to then sell the products for cheaper, which then, in theory, 
you know, drives more business and of course feeds, you know, fuels the, the whole cycle of more users. So price is extraordinarily important to the industry. And as this um, chart reflects, they spend the vast majority, that bottom part of the chart, on um, of, of the, all of their entire marketing budget. The vast majority is spent on reducing the price in the retail environment. And in some ways, it's, it's, you're, it's evident, and you can see those offers of buy one, get one, et cetera. But in some ways, it's behind the scenes, and you're not aware of it. Um, and also, of course, it just contributes to the overall marketing um, that you know, the retailers are plastered with. Without these price promotions, it'd be less really need to, to plaster their messaging. So this, um, it, this is just a picture of New York State that we have mapped out with, uh, again, each, each, there's a dot, and each of those dots is an active tobacco retailer, um, and you can see the density, um, and in New York, you can see the numbers listed up there. So this approach that we talked to, the number, type, location, and price promotions, that's the overall density and the marketing um, within at each of those stores. Each of those dots represents a store plastered with marketing, uh, prices being competitive and lowered, and together, again, they create this uh, very accessible, very um, normalized product. And so tobacco industry is really master of those marketing, the three Ps, which is price, place, and promotion. So it is accessible, it's affordable, um, and really, again, if you consider each retailer as a recruitment center, we talked about each retailer being a messenger for the company, and they each do that in different ways. Um, and while these retailers or these recruitment centers are correlated with population density, we know from the literature that outlet density and therefore the density of the marketing is tied to income and in some cases race disparities and educational attainment disparities. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment, some specifics. Um, but just um, to recap how the tobacco marketing is effective. Um, it is overall, it's just the prevalence and just the message it sends by being everywhere, by being in more places than more, you can more easily get tobacco products than you can get cash out of an ATM, than pizza, the McDonald's. I mean, it is everywhere, which just sends so many messages about the prevalence of use. People tend to overwhelmingly overestimate the um, percentage of the population that currently uses tobacco because it is so common. So it also really dilutes the resolve to quit. It serves as a smoking cue and it uh, triggers yearnings. So for those people who are trying to quit when they see that marketing or see the product itself, which, which is its own marketing tool, the packaging, it may, um, it increases um, impulse purchasing um, it increases the desire to actually use a product that you, you may not get if you hadn't been exposed to it. So um, there really is a growing body of research that higher density is correlated with thwarted attempts to quit tobacco. It's correlated with higher use youth rates. Um, and there's a solid body of evidence that looks at how increasing or decreasing uh, the number of outlets can help um, reduce that associated use. So I believe now we are on to another polling question. question. But we have a question for you. So Brenda would like to know, based on your research, is the youth recall about marketing also true in the inverse? Therefore, um, do anti-smoking campaigns and commercials, marketing, do they really stand out or stick out to a youth, dem a younger demographic? That's an interesting question. I, um, I don't know about the retail anti-smoking or, or, you know, the education, educational, most of the tobacco control marketing, the messages that we, um, in the tobacco control community are airing are 
maybe less in the retail environment. It's hard, they don't have a hook to get it in there. So it's paid media that is typically targeted. So if it's the truth campaign, for example, it will be targeted if it's on television during television shows that youth are watching. So it's already targeted to play at hours or in places for their target audience or the CDC's campaigns, same thing, are targeted towards the audience who they think um, are using tobacco. So I don't know that there's evidence whether um, anti-tobacco marketing in the retail environment is picked up by youth at a greater rate. I don't have the answer to that, but I don't get the sense that there is much in the retail environment, if that makes sense. Thank you. So we were talking about the different ways in which the marketing actually changes perceptions and drives use. And um, it's just, it's important to consider that it's easy to overlook the different ways uh, that communities are impacted. Um, but in fact, the industry does not apply their strategies equally. Community retail environments look very different uh, depending on the type of neighborhood and which populations live there. So um, we can take a look at what those stores look like and um, what it translates to. So as most of you probably know, there are significant disparities in tobacco use. And I know you heard about it on previous calls. So specific populations, um, the highest use low educational attainment, low SES, um, there's low mental health, LGBTQ, those are some of the higher use um, populations. It's less commonly recognized. There's also disparities in quit success. And at least in New York, um, smokers are far more likely to try to quit and far less success successful in achieving long-term cessation. I don't know that that's been studied as much outside of New York, but um, it probably wouldn't be um, an anomaly in, in, to, in one state, although there are different factors. But um, regardless, they over outside and inside of New York, there seem to be lower, um, uh, there are disparities in quit successes. And there's a lot of factors in that, but the retail environment, again, certainly is one of those factors. Um, if we look at these neighborhoods, um, it's really no surprise, given what we know about the impact of the retail environment, that there are um, different um, differential retail densities. So, if you look at the location, if you look at the type, and if you look at the price of products, where they're offered, how they're offered, for how much, they uh, are not equally applied. The marketing is more visible in low, uh, lower income areas, low areas with low educational attainment. There's more of it. It's more visible. There's um, more stores. Again, this can be uh, whether in rural or otherwise. So. Uh, again, there are um, more tobacco retailers in disadvantaged communities as compared to communities with resources. Um, disadvantaged communities are exposed to more tobacco marketing and advertising. Uh, there are disadvantaged communities are exposed to more industry price promotions. These price, the products are actually being sold for less off the shelf in some cases and uh, often the communities are receiving more direct mail and direct advertising uh, with price reduction promotions. So there is a uh, significant, there's a lot of research about, is it really about the density of the population and does that correlate to the increased retail or is it the actual population that is present and um, they have been able to successfully um, isolate and identify the actual types of population living in the community and correlate that with the type of marketing and the number of retailers, et cetera. So now we're on to the solutions. And I know I'm winding down on time, but we'll get through these quickly and then we can have a discussion. I think there's a polling question um, now. Yes. So for this poll question, we're it is a free response question and we would like to know from our audience members what do you think will be the best solutions to address tobacco retailer density in marginalized communities? And we'll keep this open throughout the solutions segment. 
All right, if that's staying open, then um, I will continue and we'll look at what, what your answers are. I'm curious to see. So reviewing our um, the cycle of these, um, the positive feedback cycle of the environment and perceptions and behaviors, it is, you know, really comes down to this prevalence and the presence in the community. Um, and they, because of the factors I just identified and the disparities, you know, the, the disparate number of retailers, how they're clustered, how they advertise, um, they really have a much greater presence in the uh, vulnerable populations and the disadvantaged populations that we identified. Um, so really the question is what can be done and why policy specifically? And it is critical to really have policy. A lot of some knee-jerk reaction would say, well, why don't we work with the retailers? We can educate our community retailers or members of our community. They're trying to run a business and not harm. So let's not vilify them, go through some voluntary programs. And that has been tried, utterly unsuccessful. And if you recall the uh, retailer incentives to sell the products that I went over before, that's really the biggest interference with a voluntary program and why policy is necessary. With that huge dollar amount coming from the manufacturers to the retailers, um, they the retailers are really bound through those dollars, uh, the perception that the retailer feels that they must sell these products to stay competitive and to stay in business, which isn't necessarily accurate, but nonetheless, the manufacturers will certainly help the, the retailers feel as though they need tobacco products to be a successful business. They incentivize them to sell products and they bind them to the tobacco company's marketing strategies. So these tobacco, the retailers enter into marketing contracts with manufacturers and these Manufacturers dictate where the products are placed, the number of advertisements, how much shelf space is used, where those shelves are to be located. And the more they do, the more they sell, and the more profitable it is to retailers. So there, that goes to really to the control again. The manufacturers are controlling the retail environments. So we really aren't trying to vilify the local retailers. This really is all driven back and can be pointed directly into the hands of the tobacco industry. And that's an important point as well when there's uh, attempts at the community level to change what's happening in the retail environment to really try to keep the onus where it belongs on the tobacco companies. Um, they dictate everything again about the store setup to what types of price promotions can be offered um, and what types of products are distributed, how they're advertised, and everything else. Um, this is just an example of um, what the retail environment must look like, and you know, according to one diorama, just to, they really get very, very precise, um, and something that isn't always appreciated. Um, I think there was a question that I saw a few people wanted to know about actual harm to retailer. And again, we have materials on this, but I'll just mention that there is uh, really not very good evidence that one of the tobacco company's favorite things to do is to say any type of tobacco control would be detrimental to that business. So if people smoke on airplanes or can't smoke on airplanes, no one will ever fly again. If people can't smoke at bars and restaurants, no one will ever go out to eat again. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So the retail environment is just another uh, another time where they say if they can't sell tobacco products, these businesses will go out of business. And they necessarily, th that message doesn't necessarily come from the tobacco companies, but they will feed it down to their front groups who then, um, who then make those claims at the community level. And of course, business harm is very important to local policymakers. And so it scares everyone away from making effective policy change. The research on harm to retailers is scarce, if any. Uh, there is research that suggests that despite retailers' claims, there's not a lot of uh, the foot traffic driven by tobacco sales does not translate into uh, significant profitable sales rest of the store, most go right to the counter, make their purchase, and then leave. Um, so just the overall message there is that there's uh, not any good evidence about um, harm to the retailer 
by restricting um, where sales can happen, which then brings me to the solution specifically. So we talked about the number, the type, and the location of the retailer, and we talked about the price promotions. And so the, these are, the, the evidence is there that this doesn't, these are factors that drive use and specifically drive disparities in tobacco use. And so policies that restrict retail density, number, type, location, um, or reduce tobacco marketing at the point of sale, including the price promotions, are going to be effective in reducing that desire in the market for tobacco products. So there are a lot of ways you can restrict where and how tobacco is sold. Um, and that includes, uh, they're all going to be sales restrictions. Local communities have authority to restrict the sales of tobacco. Um, I say that not every state, um, every state has it, not every state has passed that right along to their municipalities. So you have to know what kind of state you're in, but the vast majority of states do. And the big message just to think about are, in the, yeah, at the state level or at the community level, you can limit the number. You could just put a cap on the number of retailers, or you could do a proportion of uh, retailers, the number of retailers to the community or to other stores or to land use. There's a lot of numerous ways to limit the number of retailers. You can regulate the location of retailers. You can restrict them. You put buffer zones around schools and youth-centered places, so rec centers, parks, etc. cetera. Um, you can think about the messenger. Who's the messenger? And so for and restrict the type of retailer that is able to sell tobacco products. So pharmacies is a good example. And you'll see that being done in California and in um, Massachusetts, but hasn't really taken off anywhere else, although New York did get um, one municipality to do so. Um, it seems like that's an easy one. You can also restrict how um, tobacco products are sold. And specifically, you can regulate uh, sales by prohibiting the redemption of certain types of price promotion. So you're not uh, able to say that a manufacturer uh, can't put out a coupon, but you can say that the retailers in your community cannot redeem those coupons. When you take that away, then the marketing goes away. If they're not able to collect the coupon, then they're not going to be able to market it. And so the price promotions that are so prevalent will disappear. So again, state and in most cases, local governments can reduce the number, type, and location of retailers. There's a lot of different ways you can do this as a standalone laws. You can do this through zoning. You can do this through licensing. I'm not going to get into great detail on this because um, really, need, when the policymakers are interested in doing it, that's when we'd love to talk to them, or we can answer your questions offline about that. About that. But um, that's the big picture takeaway is that we talked about a lot of the problems, and the good news is there are solutions. But you will face great opposition from the tobacco industry and need to be prepared to, to effectively oppose the opposition, which comes into our last uh, our collaboration. Um, and that's where you can get involved. Um, I'm going to answer this question that I see pop up. Um, do I know of any areas that have banned the sales at petrol stations or by type of retailer? So there are communities that have, that prohibit tobacco product sales through pharmacies. Um, I don't know of any that do at petrol stations. Um, that would be um, a great, that since the majority of retailers are typically convenience stores slash gas stations, that would be an effective one. There, there would need to be a health and safety rationale, which could be made in almost all cases when you're restricting the sale of tobacco products. It's easy to make a, a health rationale for that law. But um, the short answer is I don't know of any who have restricted from petrol stations, but it is something that one could consider. Um, another type of store would be adult only, so or you could restrict sales to retailers that only serve adults. You could say 18 up or 21 plus. So again, um, any of these policies would be vehemently opposed. A lot of money is going to come in to fight them. It's going to be from the manufacturers or funneled through other groups. And um, a very 
positive step and is to collaborate as stakeholders is to be aware and involved in what are the initiatives that are being discussed in the community and supported by the community and partnering, um, being aware of the dollars that are coming into community, lobbying, campaign contributions, being aware of public hearings and speaking up. A lot of community education that is driven um, by state departments of health are just that, education on different policy options, but they're not able to lobby. So if you're able to, as an independent citizen, become informed and um, really work to try to talk to your local constituent about local change that can be very impactful to the community, then um, that is that is certainly one way to collaborate since you do have um, access and education about how effective these, these policies can be because uh, it really needs to be bottom up. You're not going to get these policies handed down from the top because of the money that the tobacco industry has uh, vested in their retailers. Um, you won't see decision makers independently proposing uh, sales restrictions. So coalitions are really driven by the community and you're part of that community. Um, the extent that you're able to be involved and aware of best practices um, and aware of the local coalitions that are already working on these issues in your areas um, and um, that seems to be um, a good good next steps. I'm open to discussion about other other ideas that you have and thoughts of, of ways to be involved using the resources that you you may have. That is all I have. Question and answer. So we will be taking questions from your registration, but we will also be accepting live questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the presenter Q&A pod, and I will be taking questions from registration. Our first question, what are retailers doing to detour sales of tobacco products? If I understand the question correctly, what are retailers doing to deter them? They actually uh, would like to drive business. I mean, that is, there again, retailers are profit, you know, primarily interested in driving profit, so they're interested in selling the products. Um, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding the question, though. I think the question is in the space of, and I'm paraphrasing, so what can retailers do? Ah, in, okay, what can, what can retailers do? Yes. So retailers, well, stop selling, the, stop selling tobacco products would be ideal. Um, they could theoretically sell the products but not engage in the contracts with manufacturers. So that would mean that they could they might sell the products but not market and they wouldn't be they would not be beholden to having to market the, you know have the shelf space and the mark the huge advertisements anywhere and everywhere that the industry dictates um, a retailer if they did actually stop selling the product could cover the displays of tobacco products and so not even not display them at all not have them uh, of within sight in the public is in the store so if they did again ideally they would choose not to sell the product at all but they could um, actually cover the product and just have those customers who already knew what they wanted come in but not have it uh, the, the product displays are a very effective marketing in their own right and they're called power walls and they um, really grab attention so covering those would be a great voluntary step but again Hopefully, from my talk, you understood the importance of having a policy rather than the voluntary retail um, reaction. Thank you. Do you want me to read the questions that I'm seeing, or? I'm sure, yes, you can take questions from the audience. So we are receiving some questions live, yes. So are there incentives for retailers to either promote anti-tobacco messaging or eliminate the sales of tobacco, tax incentives, or points? Um, so incentives to promote anti-tobacco messaging, I'm not aware of any of those. Um, well, I can talk about one, one initiative in New York City that I'm familiar with, but the other was tax incentives. There are initiatives um, where tobacco control, perhaps in conjunction with, uh, with healthy food organizations or whatnot, so healthy retail initiatives. And tax incentives could be one answer where community is promoting healthy retailers. And now it might be um, increasing access to fresh foods and reducing access to non-nutritional items, um, including tobacco products. So there are some communities who have um, looked into 
healthy retailer programs. Um, and I have a question here about research that looks at tax increases and floor pricing policies and their effect on illegal trafficking and selling of cigarettes. Um, okay, so, um, so absolutely price is a tremendous factor in use and tax, so whether ta uh, prices are kept high from state taxes, and it is typically only the state that has taxing authority with, with some isolated cities, um, it can also be other ways to keep products high, such as minimum uh, sales prices or increasing packaging of products so that when they're grouped together, they're, they're more expensive. So there's a lot of different ways in terms of its correlation with trafficking. So New York is a prime example of this. There is um, the I-95 corridor has uh, is known for bringing uh, cigarettes in particular up from low tax states, Virginia, North Carolina, up through to New York and New York City. There's also um, Native American reservations in New York that sell their sell products for lower prices. And so when you have very high price, you know, high price disparity between other states or regions within the state. Um, there is indication that there there can be and there is increased black market or um, great trafficking and illicit sales. So the common wisdom right now um, is that, and the research suggests that although there will be some users who do go to illicit sales and illicitly acquiring tobacco products, overwhelmingly, uh, especially among the populations that use at the highest rate, they will see much greater quit rates. So there will be some rollover, but there is, it's still a positive, it is not a aggressive policy in that users will um, typically try to quit and be successful at quitting. A good resource and model retail license policy. Um, all right, I'm glad you asked. Um, we have, um, and it's a, one of the resources on our website, we, um, we being the policy center, um, a mod, we actually do have model policy. So the best practice is really a, to go through license, local licensing of tobacco retailers and really stress that with local licensing, there's local accountability. If you're trying to regulate the sales um, on a local level, but you don't even know where the products are being sold because they don't, maybe they register with the state, but in the case of e-cigarettes, maybe they don't, depending on your state. Uh, you really need to have a sense of what's going on in your communities. If you're going to reduce the number, if you're going to reduce the type of store, you want to, you know, it's a great way to start by getting a sense um, through licensing of where those retailers are, who they are, you can get information about them. And then with that, um, there's different approaches. So you can attach sales restrictions to the license. So you can attach all of them. You could, you could have a number cap. You could have a um, buffer zone around school. So if you are a retailer that sells drugs or has a pharmacy in it, you may not also sell. And if you're within a thousand feet of the school, you may not sell. And, you know, if you're a, we only are going to allow X number in this community. So you can attach one, two, three, more or less of those policies to a licensing scheme. We have a model policy on our website. It's for New York specifically, localities in New York, but it's largely applicable to others. We just would, of course, suggest that, um, someone familiar with the state you're in, review it um, for authority and other. So I hope that answers that. Okay, so what's the best first step a tobacco control program can take when attempting to address retail density? So with all policy change, uh, best first step is really education. People really, uh, it's really, a it's a little more complicated to understand how density impacts tobacco use with our smoke-free policies. For those of you who were around, you know, it's really those policies took off. People understood. I get it. There's secondhand smoke. It bothers me. I don't want to be around it. Whether I smoke or not, I don't want to smell others. And policies uh, really just took off once, um, once people realized that there was something that they could, in fact, um, impose. With tobacco retail um, density, people 
are less aware of, of the marketing and the role that marketing plays in tobacco use. They're less aware that how much control in the retail environment the industry has on those retailers. So education, 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 I'd say, is the first step um, for, for those policies. And assessing, doing a, an assessment of the community and understanding really what is happening in your community, who is selling, where are they sold, um, what type of advertising accompanies that. Um, and it can be pretty remarkable when you actually do a good community retail assessment. Can pharmacies with Medicare Medicaid contracts be regulated not to sell tobacco? That would be a federal, at the federal level, would ha it would have to come from the federal level, I imagine. Um, and so I'm going to say maybe, <laughs> and um, but probably not something that on the local level would be a policy to um, work towards. And ideas on how to address retailer incentives from the tobacco industry. Well, one thought is we don't always fully know what the incentive Con what those contracts between the tobacco industry and the retailers look like. Uh, we only know to the extent that we can get that information because it's not, it's not public. But there, there can be local laws passed. It could be part of a licensing requirement or other, like sunshine laws, we'd call them, where one of the things to uh, a retailer needs to report to the state or to the municipality is what their incentives are, what are their contracts with the tobacco industry. So if you want to sell tobacco in our community, you need to let us know uh, what is influencing your store or your income and think, you know, there are different ways to devise it. So that is one way to influence the incentives is to figure out and learn what they are. Um, it may not be the shortest term to change, but it would be great information. And I know researchers would, would love to learn more about that. Um, but another way to counter those incentives includes uh, there's a lot of pricing policies that a community can do. So one that I had mentioned is restricting the redemption of certain price promotions. So a retailer in your community, you could suggest, is not able to um, redeem coupons or to have a buy one, get one free. So you buy one pack of cigarettes, get a package of snooze or, or something else. Um, so that can help. Um, you know, the, the retailers are still going to have incentives to lower their prices, but some of the price promotions they will not be eligible to participate in. That doesn't mean that industry won't think of new ones, but um, it's a start. And there's also minimum price laws you could, uh, or packaging, the way you package the products, um, group them together. Anything that will help keep prices high will have a significant impact and a disparate impact on the populations that we need to target, those populations that are using at a higher rate. Cleared all of our live questions. So I will leave it now to you, Alana, to make a, a closing statement or share a closing thought with our audience. OK, well, great. Um, well, again, I will reiterate, given some of the questions I saw um, from before I started uh, wanting some of the evidence base and some of the citations. So there are, we do have our website, tobaccopolicycenter.org. Uh, in the tobacco control landing page, there's a story map that's interactive and, and can also show a little bit of the mapping where stores are. Uh, there's a lot of resources on our website. Um, I encourage you to take a look. Um, the model licensing, since somebody asked, we do have a this is a model. Um, you can familiarize yourself. It goes through the rationale. What I talked about, number, you know, about density, number, type, location, price. Uh, it's our tobacco retail licensing um, to technical report. So it will cover the, um, some of those. But, um, but the big picture summary to give is that the tobacco industry really drives tobacco use. This isn't something that just happens. Um, you know, by chance, the tobacco industry is instrumental in orchestrating uh, how tobacco is sold, is used, who's attractive to it, and who's using. And they are part of, um, partly responsible for driving the disparities we see today in tobacco use. Uh, and so, keeping that in mind, policy response response is appropriate. And uh, given the 
there are some restrictions on what localities can do, but there's a great leeway in the most part, in most states, for what uh, policy responses can be to restrict the voice that tobacco manufacturers have in your community, because they do right now um, have Am I being frozen out? No, I'll come back. All right. So tobacco manufacturers really have a role in your community. And just to think about what do you want your community to look like and who do you want to have a voice? So I see one more question, which I can, um, is there a way to acquire retail sales data? What type of tobacco products get sold at what locations? That would be only if your state collects it or if you chose to. We do know national data on market share, for instance, we do know how many, um, for what, what is sold maybe by state in terms of brands of cigarettes in any, in any case, and I think maybe smokeless tobacco, um, but it would be, it may not be, it's not going to be aggregated by community. So that would be something to collect at the community level. So again, big takeaway is that industry drives this use, it drives disparities in use, and that there are local solutions, and really encourage you to stay educated and involved. Thank you so very much for an extremely informative and engaging presentation. And as Dr. Knopf mentioned, the Tobacco Retail Licensing Technical Report and Model Policy Brief or Paper is listed under the website resources in addition to today's presentation and a host of other resources which have been provided by the South Carolina Tobacco Free Collaborative and the Tobacco Policy Center. And I hope that and on um, disparities and vulnerable populations are in there too. So thanks. Absolutely. If not, we can share that with the with all of the registrants and participants. And that brings us to the conclusion of today's webinar. And on behalf of the South Carolina Tobacco Free Collaborative, we thank you for your attendance and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.